So uh, it's a tremendous honor to have received the Cattell Fellow Award. I'm going to present a few findings of many from our multiple levels of analysis approach in developmental psychopathology at Berkeley, uh, now a uh, secondary appointment I have at UCSF. And then we'll finish up talking just a little bit about the uh, stigma of mental health, uh, which remains a, a huge issue. So let's, let's get started. So we're going to start with the first uh, boring slide. I spend six weeks of my undergraduate course going through all this before we even start to talk about disorders. So in developmental psychopathology, you can't really know the atypical unless you know the typical, but could the study of the atypical actually inform normative development? We're talking about that somewhat in the talk. Multiple levels of analysis, neurons to neighborhoods, all the different acronyms that can be used uh, will be another feature. What kinds of continuities do we see in longitudinal studies? Are they homotypic or are they heterotypic? Are we really able to get at the phenomenon through tests of linear models? Genes and biology and environment, their interplay are crucially involved in everything we're talking about. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit to say about unexpectedly good outcomes, this controversial but important field of uh, positive adaptation and resilience. So uh, your test uh, for your continuing ed credit when you leave is, can you find any of these themes in the next slides that we're talking about? So the dimensions of inattention and impulsivity, the disorder of ADHD are constantly in the news, very controversial. We learned from Angeline Lillard's study a few years ago that the cause of ADHD is SpongeBob SquarePants. And this was a very interesting developmental study she did at Virginia of four-year-olds who really showed executive dysfunction after they watched SpongeBob compared to a public television nature show. But the New York Times front page said that the cause of ADHD was SpongeBob. Of course, it's actually Patrick, not SpongeBob, if you've ever watched the show. Is the cause of ADHD starting kindergarten early, depending on your birth date? The kids who've just begun because of that September 1st cutoff at four are 30 to 35 percent more likely to get an ADHD diagnosis by the end of the school year than the kids further along. So is this an immaturity syndrome? The old factor name from Quay's studies in the 50s was the immaturity factor. And we'll have more to say about that in a few minutes in terms of neural immaturity maybe driving this syndrome in some kids. If you want to see stigma, if you want to see ridicule, don't look at the news, but look at the Sunday review and op-eds in the New York Times in the last few years about ADHD. It's a made-up disorder, medications are poisons. We don't find this in the times for PTSD or bipolar illness. So there's something going on about ADHD that's really attracting a ton of negative attention. And some of it's deserved with some of the overdiagnosis we'll be talking about. Maybe the bottom line is that most diagnoses are made of kids by a pediatrician in 10 to 15 minutes in an office visit, or for adults by a general practitioner with no rating scales, uh, no developmental history, no evidence-based practice. Maybe everybody's getting the diagnosis to get better accommodations, and of course everybody wants to take these medications because they're smart pills and make everybody do better. We'll have something to say about that. So, before we really dive in, under fair use, I don't work for pharma, but I can show a couple of ads that pharma puts out that I think are quite revealing about the messages around ADHD and attention impulsivity. So here's an early ad in the early 2000s for Concerta, the first really long-lasting stimulant. It's just essentially Ritalin uh, in a formulation that spreads it out over 8, 10, 12 hours. And we see that Jason and his mother are smiling and that when Jason takes his medication, his mother sees Jason, not his ADHD. Now, this is a very powerful message, whether true or not. It's really implicitly the first anti-stigma medication ad. If you medicate your kid, you see the real kid, not those annoying symptoms. So it takes away the stigma. Here's an ad from a little bit later, uh, maybe eight, nine years ago for Adderall XR extended release, tapping by far now the biggest growing market for ADHD uh, medications, which is adults. So if you can look closely, you'll see citations to the fact that if you have ADHD as an adult, you're about twice as likely to get divorced and about twice as likely to have major depression as those without. 
causal assertions aside, it's another powerful message about if you want to stay in a relationship and avoid depression, ADHD medications are the thing for you. So the third ad, briefly, is with Shane Victorino, the first Hawaiian American to play uh, Major League Baseball. And he has an exemption. Why does Shane tell his story about ADHD? Because if he didn't and didn't have a medical exemption, the stimulants he would take would be banned, just the way other performance enhancers are. Now, I don't know what your feelings are about sports. Baseball is either a tremendous game of concentration and skill or the most boring sport ever invented. And if you believe it's the latter, it's interesting that twice as many MLB players have exemptions for ADHD as Major League Football or hockey or basketball. Because in the ninth inning, after four hours, if that line drive is coming toward you, you better stay focused. So is there really twice the epidemiologic rate of ADHD in Major League Baseball, or are the stimulants being used as performance enhancers in a sport that requires long periods of ennui and then sudden need for focus? So it raises some of these issues. On the serious side, if you're a kid who meets diagnostic criteria, the cost to society beyond treatment was estimated last year at about $100 billion. Special education, substance abuse, and if you're an adult, mainly because of employment-related problems, about $200 billion last year. So it's a costly condition, uh, whatever its legitimacy as a disease or not. Kids with ADHD, especially if they're aggressive, are less liked by their peers than any other group diagnostically we, we know of. Peer rejection is a causal factor, as well as a reflection, uh, causing, we think, difficult outcomes later on. So. We need to think about treatments as affecting peer relationships, not just symptoms. We'll have a lot more to say about families, not only the genes they transmit, but the kinds of climates in the homes of kids with ADHD as being quite important mechanistically and in terms of treatment. Kids with ADHD from the preschool years all the way to beyond kiddom to adulthood have high rates of accidental injury. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, an important argument against the contention that ADHD is just a societal excuse for bothersome behavior. And as you go developmentally, the core trait impulsivity transmogrifies into ADHD in the early years, often comorbid with oppositional defiant symptoms, conduct disorder, substance abuse, and in a subset, adult antisocial personality disorder. So are these really separate disorders? in a diagnostic system, or is it a heterotypically continuous unfolding? We'll have a little bit more to say about that. So what's going on in the minds and brains of people who get diagnosed? ADHD is clearly a continuously distributed set of traits. It's right for the RDoC approach. If RDoC was going to target anything that is really on a dimension rather than uh, a priori categories, ADHD would be a classic example. Is it really an attention deficit or a wider set of deficits in executive functions, working memory, et cetera, et cetera? Russ Barkley's influential model from 19 years ago would contend that really the core is poor response inhibition. And if you don't do that very well, you never get a chance to enact the other executive functions. An older model of ADHD is that it is a motivational deficit dopamine centers in the deep in the brain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this was given new life a few years ago by Nora Volkow's uh, important study in JAMA, looking at about 70 adults, 60 match controls. The adults never medicated uh, in the ADHD group. And in these never medicated adults, in exactly the places you might suspect, striatum, you can look at the bottom of the slide to see some of the brain regions, 40% fewer receptors for dopamine in exactly these regions. Also, about 35 to 40 percent fewer transporters, which you'd think there'd be more transporters. Uh, the brain is more complicated than you might think uh, uh, in a nutshell. But this has revived the notion that for many individuals, ADHD may be reflecting a difficulty in sustaining motivation as well as attention uh, and a deficit in intrinsic motivation. What about the frontal cortex? Seat of a lot of interest, of course, uh, for a long time and currently. In the important work of Phil Shaw and his colleagues at NIH, 
Kids with ADHD are about three to three and a half years delayed in the maximum thickness of the prefrontal cortex, which is usually around the age of six or so and is nine to nine and a half in ADHD populations. As the cortex thins again in adolescents, it's the same lag for people with ADHD, and the thickness of the cortex is highly correlated with symptoms. So maybe there is something to immaturity. There's a neural immaturity. We don't know if that's a direct genetic expression, an epigenetic uh, expression of those genes, but it raises the issue that I raised at the very beginning of the talk, that immaturity may be an important, not just side feature, uh, but core feature of this condition. ADHD is not simply located in the striatum or in the frontal lobes. In Castellanos's recent work, uh, it's a widely distributed uh, set of not very efficient neural transmission patterns. Do genes have a lot to do with ADHD? They do. Every twin in adoption study reveals heritabilities of somewhere between 75 and 80 percent. Low birth weight, maternal alcohol, perhaps maternal smoking. There are other biological risk factors early in development that are quite salient. Too many people think that because of this, ADHD is fixed and immutable and not susceptible to psychosocial influence, which I hope to dissuade you of. But what's the cause of ADHD with all this psychobiology? The cause of ADHD essentially is compulsory education, which began a couple hundred years ago because it revealed for the first time in history that subset of individuals, kids, who don't focus very well. So it's really, I think, plausible to say that ADHD is 100% biological and 100% cultural in terms of the non-zero-sum game of causal influences. So what about parenting? Temperament exists. Kids with ADHD often show temp different difficult temperamental traits from very early in development. There's no good research that shows that poor parenting is a causal factor in a primary sense. But what do parents do when they've got kids with these symptoms? Fight fire with fire, get in coercive chains of discipline. So it's a maintaining rather than a primary cause. And because of the heritability statistics, many parents of kids with ADHD have the symptoms themselves, whether or not diagnosed. So now we have gene environment correlation quite rampantly occurring. Parent management is a very essential part of any good intervention for ADHD. And the question, of course, is do you need to work on the parent's own depression or inattention, impulsivity itself, if you will, before they can become good parent managers? And there's good active research on that. So we did a study some years ago, got published in Child Development. We could not randomly assign kids at risk for ADHD to live in certain homes for the next 10 years. Our, our, our IRB was a little uh, trepidatious about that. We did the next best thing at our summer camps, which is to measure a whole lot of behaviors in parents and kids. The goal of the study was to predict positive peer regard. So who are the resilient kids socially? Almost as an afterthought, we put in the equation the worst way of measuring parenting available, which is questionnaires that parents report on their own parenting. Uh, but the ideas about parenting scale has pretty good validity. And we found an authoritative factor. Authoritative parenting being that upper right quadrant of high warmth and responsiveness and high limit setting, support for autonomy, use of reasoning. The parents of our boys with ADHD were much lower on this authoritative factor than the parents of our controls. Effect size of nearly 0.8. High variance, however. And when we put into the equation to predict positive peer regard at the end of the summer, it was authoritative parenting that was the only significant predictor, not the day-to-day -day behaviors we measured, of this high social competence. We found this effect only in the group with ADHD. The effect was zero in the comparison group. So the suggestion is that super parenting might be protective for social competence in a group with ADHD. But if you believe in gene environment correlation, you're saying, well, that can't happen. Or it can, but it's because of shared genes. So in the important adoption research of Gordon Harold and his other British colleagues, some from the States too, published uh, three falls ago, in adoptive samples, we find very similar patterns. Early ADHD symptoms 
predict over-controlling non-authoritative parenting, and that same parenting, controlling for everything else, predicts the maintenance of ADHD symptoms over the next half decade. So parenting does matter even if you take out of the equation gene-environment correlation. What about girls with ADHD? So we'll shift gears just a little bit. 20 years ago, I wrote a grant to the NIMH wondering whether we should study girls with ADHD. There was a belief that it hardly ever existed. Uh, after a revision round, uh, it got a 0.1 percentile score. I think it was the top-ranked grant at the Institute that year and all of a sudden interest was changing. So we ran our summer camp methodology uh, for a pretty good sized sample of girls with ADHD and published our first findings in JCCP in July of 2002. By my count, that day we doubled the world's literature on girls with ADHD. That's how little had been done before systematically. Found that their academic and social competence was quite compromised looked at neuropsychological functioning, got continued NIMH grants to systematically follow them up 5, 10, and now 16 years later with uh, good retention rates. So just a little schematic. Baseline was grade school, a follow-up wave in adolescence, another follow-up wave in the earliest years of adulthood, and we are just analyzing data now for our 25 to 27, age 25 to 27, 16-year follow-up. How do we get 93, 94, 95% of the kids back. Uh, we are relentless, we ran good programs, and social media like Facebook is an excellent way to follow longitudinal samples that go into adulthood. We were looking at a different outcome from our homotypically continuous ones by the time the girls weren't girls anymore, they were young adults. So we took a look at self-harm, both suicide attempts, where there was an intent to die, and NSSI, non-suicidal self-injury. So in one of the only sets of findings that showed any subtype differences, it was only the girls, back when they were girls, who had the combined form, and dimensionally this means they had a lot of impulsivity, when they were girls that 10 years later had significant uh, effect on these outcomes. So, Long story short, 23% of the combined type girls had made a serious suicide attempt by the age of 20. 8% of our inattentive group, 6% of our normative comparisons. For non-suicidal self-injury, 51% were actively engaged in moderate to severe levels, about a quarter of our inattentive, and 19% of the comparisons. 6% of normal girls are showing suicide attempts, 19% serious non-suicidal self-injury. Those are exactly the national base rates that Matt Nock and his colleagues, who actually consult with our grant, are showing in epidemiologic studies. This is an epidemic, but if you've had early impulsivity, it raises the base rate two and a half to three and a half fold. So what does a good developmental psychopathologist team do? Try to find mechanisms and make use of longitudinal perspective data. So in Erica Swanson's dissertation published in JCPP two years ago, here we're predicting first the severity of the self-injury, the cutting, burning, mutilation from childhood ADHD and our adolescent measures, our temporal mediators. A cold cognition measure of response inhibition, the venerable cancel underline test, and parent and teacher ratings of the girl's externalizing features almost fully mediated, mediated this link. On the other hand, if the prediction is to suicide attempts, not NSSI, only parent, teacher, and child reported internalizing symptoms in adolescence were partial mediators. So even though a good predictor of later suicide attempts is NSSI, they're not as distinct empirically as they are conceptually, we're finding a different pattern of adolescent mediators. Recently published findings by Jocelyn Mesa in our lab took a look at the peer domain. Here, the girls' report of how victimized they were physically and verbally by their peers was a strong partial mediator of, again, the severity of NSSI. The predictor here is a dimensional measure of response inhibition rather than categorical. 
but it was teachers' reports into Sean's sociometric teacher rating of how rejected the girls were, sort of the opposite of social preference, that was the partial mediator of suicide attempt. So the neuropsychological domain, the comorbidity domain, social preference domain are all important, but slightly differently to predict NSSI versus suicide attempt. And what about maltreatment and trauma? Paper just published in Dante's journal, Development and Psychopathology, Maya Gundelman, now an intern at UCLA, and our team, published findings not only that the girls with ADHD were more likely to have been physically or sexually abused or neglected as kids, but that within the ADHD group, that maltreated subgroup, their rates of suicide attempt were 36, 37 percent. So it's very similar to the literature on bipolar disorder, quite heritable, but early maltreatment predicts difficult symptom uh, patterns, uh, earlier onset, and difficulty to treat. As heritable as ADHD is, early maltreatment seems to be compounding the risk, but in a heterotypically continuous way, not to predict so much externalizing behavior as self-injury and suicide attempt. Also found quickly at the bottom of this slide here uh, that uh, intimate partner violence was highly uh, significantly uh, increased in the ADHD group uh, related to our comparisons. So where are we at this midpoint? If you think, after listening, that ADHD is a nice categorical box in DSM on um, that all the descriptions have been made of it accurately, you'd be sadly mistaken. It's not a static thing. Uh, it's a very dynamic set of traits interacting with multiple contextual influences across development. So there's equifinal patterns, different causal mechanisms. There's multifinality. Not every kid with ADHD grows up in exactly the same way or with exactly the same impairments. Peer relationships, academic performance, executive functions, motivation are as important as the symptoms themselves. And development, just to reiterate, parenting, peer relationships, and maybe if we go to a wider level of analysis, we might explain some of this diagnostic uh, explosion that we've experienced uh, in recent years might provide another lens for looking at ADHD. So that's what we'll do. We'll talk about the tidal wave of diagnosis. The National Survey of Children's Health is the database here. Centers for Disease Control has added ADHD symptoms to this random phone dial of 100,000 families every few years in the United States. The baseline for this was 2003. 7.8% of kids represented in these parent responses had heard a health professional say or had received a diagnosis, these families had, that their kid had ADHD. This is all kids age 4 to 17 in the United States. Four years later, that had gone up to 9.5%. Four and a half to five years later, that had gone up to 11.0%. That's a 42% increase in 10 years. That's an epidemic, but ADHD doesn't seem to be a communicable disease. What would explain such epidemic-like increases? Interestingly, also, in the most recent data, for the first time, African-American kids have more diagnosis. This isn't a white middle-class boy phenomenon anymore. It's getting closer to two to one boys to girls. Part of the reason is that back in the 90s, special education, Medicaid, SSI policies opened the floodgates, if you will, for use of ADHD as an accommodation. Talk about medications, too. Unlike the diagnosis, the rate of if your kid has ADHD, does he or she receive medicine, that has stayed at a flat 68, 69 percent for the last 10 years. So the child market has pretty much leveled off. It's the adult market, especially adult women, that's going up uh, many-fold each year. So the maps tell an interesting story, even more than the national rates. This is not equal across the United States. If you live in Arkansas, North Carolina, or Indiana, the top three, the base rate of ADHD diagnosis is close to 15%. 20% of all boys, and in those three states, for boys over 11, it's 30%. One in three boys in Arkansas, North Carolina, and Indiana have received an ADHD diagnosis by ninth grade. Something's wrong with this picture. It can't be real. 
but out west, California and Nevada, we're, way, we're with the world average, five, six, seven percent. So what could explain this kind of geographical huge divergence? Let's look, just for the sake of argument, at the medication picture. So the dark states here are 80% plus rates of medication for the diagnosed kid, the lighter colored states about half. And now it's not just the south, but it's the plains and it's the upper Midwest and it's Vermont, I don't know why Vermont, <laughs> with high rates of medication and the far west much lower. So my colleague, Richard Scheffler, a health economist and I, have been working together for 10 years, looking at what health economists and epidemiologists do, looking for patterns. Well, it has to be demographics. There's more Hispanic kids in California than in the South. They tend to be diagnosed less. And what do health economists do? Put in correction equations to pretend that every state in the union has the same rate of male, female, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, and it didn't change the pattern at all. Maybe it's health care providers. In the 3,100 plus counties in the United States, the number of cancer providers is highly correlated with diagnoses of cancer in those counties. Not for ADHD. The correlation was 0 0.00, not the p-value, the correlation. So it didn't matter how many pediatricians or child and adolescent psychiatrists there were. Maybe it's culture. So this is pop anthropology. We're rugged individualists out west. And it's, of course, a culture of honor in the South. And that ex it doesn't explain anything. Rural North Carolina is probably pretty similar to rural California. The Silicon Valley and the Research Triangle are pretty similar. The only traction we got was to go back to my half tongue in cheek premise from a few minutes ago that the cause of ADHD is compulsory education. Does educational policy make a difference? So 30. Three years ago now, the Bell Commission published its findings that the United States was falling behind in academic achievement among its kids. So we've been doing a lot ever since. And one of the things was in the 90s, many states became output focused. We're not going to just get better student-teacher ratios. We're going to incentivize districts and public schools if their test scores, the kids' test scores go up. By 2000, 30 states had enacted consequential accountability laws. So the state looks at your scores, district scores, and if they're not going up, uh, you get a penalty or your name's in the paper, or like Oakland, California a few years ago, you go into receivership. Your district's taken over. Then, in November of 2000, Bush became president, barely, but he did, and no Child Left Behind was the first major piece of domestic legislation which started in the 2002-03 school year, the baseline year for the National Survey of Children's Health. And the remaining 21 states, you include the District of Columbia, suddenly had consequential accountability. So we've got a natural experiment on our hands. We didn't randomly assign 2 thirds 60%, three-fifths of the states have these laws in place for some time, and then suddenly, beginning of 2002, three school year, the remaining 21 states are forcing accountability on the school districts. So we talked about this in our book, The ADHD Explosion. What are those states that had these early accountability laws? They were mainly the southern states. So there's circumstantial evidence that this accountability legislation was correlated with these high rates in the South already. But what if you look at a triple difference regression model in this natural experiment? For the 21 states and D.C. that suddenly got accountability in 2002-03, over the next four years, for the poorest kids in those states, the kids within 200% of the federal poverty level, their rate of ADHD diagnosis went up 59%. And for the other kids, private school kids in those states, and for the remaining 30 states that had had these laws on the books before, they went up at or below the national average. Now, what happened between the second and third waves of the National Survey of Children's Health? Obama became president. The race to the top replaced No Child Left Behind. And that trend markedly decreased. So there's some causal specificity to the contention that when districts are made accountable for their test scores, well, this wasn't the intention of No Child Left Behind. It's an unintended effect or consequence, as the policymakers call it. 
Maybe to help get those test scores up, we've got to round up and get kids diagnosed so they'll get medicated or get behavior therapy or special ed. And there was a second motive in many of the states, but not all, that if you got the kid diagnosed, special ed kids' test scores no longer count in the district's average. So they're subtracted out. Good way to raise the mean level of a distribution is to take out its lowest scores. So there were some pernicious uh, motivations behind some of this, as well as perhaps the desire to get kids treatment. But against, against the backdrop again of how are these kids getting diagnosed in a 10 or 15 minute office visit in a pediatrician's office with no evidentiary base for making the diagnosis other than perhaps a parental or teacher complaint. So the irony is what used to be the Tom Sawyer syndrome, only white middle class boys were diagnosed with ADHD, is now legitimately an equal opportunity condition, but it's now getting disproportionately diagnosed among the poorest minority kids, partly because of school accountability. Of course, there's many other factors too. Let's move quickly to treatment with no uh, chalk talk or background. If you want to reduce the symptoms of ADHD, giving stimulant medications does so 80% of the time pretty quickly and efficaciously, often with a minimum of side effects. But what if your goal is to not only reduce symptoms, but lower externalizing and internalizing comorbidity and enhance school achievement, peer relationships, and parenting practices at home? So from the MTA trial done now nearly 20 years ago, and in Connor's reanalysis of the data that we all participated in, the outcome measure here is a six factor composite of ADHD internalizing, externalizing, peer, school, uh, and home factors, and only the combined treatment, well-delivered medicine plus intensive family management, intensive school consultation, and an eight-week summer treatment program got the dark purple line going down the fastest, significantly better than medication alone or behavior therapy alone, or a treatment-as-usual condition that included medicine 68% of the time, but not very evidence-based medication. Are there moderators of outcome? Owens, Hinch et al., 2003, Journal of Consulting and Clinical, first use published of Helena Kramer's Rock software to look for sequential moderators. Looking at the symptoms of ADHD, medication did better than non-medication. But the first moderator that came in was at baseline was the primary caregiver's Beck depression inventory score, nine or above. That was an empirically selected, not rationally selected cutoff. If the primary caregiver had even mild depression, the odds of the medications affecting the child's symptoms went down precipitously. Only 45% excellent response heading towards normalization versus 69% for parents in the non-depressed range. The severity of the child's ADHD, the child's baseline IQ also moderated, showing that even evidence-based treatments don't work for everyone, and for the most severe cases, we've got a long way to go. Even mild depression in a caregiver makes it hard to implement not just doing parent training, but to even give medication optimally. And here's a slide that could use more background if we had all afternoon. Was there a group in this MTA trial that normalized? That their symptoms in school of aggression and ADHD didn't just improve, but improved into the normal range. The 10% or so, or so of kids who did were housed in, A, those who got the combination of medication and behavior therapy, and B, whose parents drastically improved towards authoritative parenting during the trial. So if parenting improved, that was the mediator variable, the red line heading down to the right, the mean level of disruptive behaviors was at the national norms. So these kids weren't just improved, they looked like their typical peers sitting next to them the power of multi-modality treatment, and change in parenting, even for as heritable a condition as ADHD, is evident in this slide. So let's finally talk about stigma. 
after a brief liquid refreshment break. I wrote a book on this topic a few years ago, The Mark of Shame, Oxford Press. I chose the Hieronymus Bosch painting, The Extraction of the Stone of Madness, as the cover image. Here, Bosch is showing the surgeon, but the surgeon is wearing a wizard hat, so there's a giveaway right there, <laughs> is extracting the stone from the gentleman's head. The belief was that in early Renaissance Holland, a stone in the head was probably a major cause of mental illness. The priest is giving a blessing. This is an old 1496 painting hanging in the Prado. Uh, this is a PowerPoint. If you look underneath the scalpel, it doesn't look like a rock is appearing. There's a couple of petals, little white tufts. If you read up, Bosch was portraying that the surgeon was removing a flower from the gentleman's head, not a stone. What was the name for mental illness in Holland in 1496? You were called a tulip head. So Bosch was painting a portrait that if you remove the label, the diagnosis, maybe you'd cure. So it's a very modern painting. Is a diagnosis disempowering or empowering? Do labels cause the symptoms? Primary versus secondary labeling theory. Uh, Bosch wasn't a student of sociology, but it's a quite prescient painting. We all know that because knowledge of mental illness is so much higher, and it is in the United States among young people, middle-aged people, older people than 50 years ago, the stigma toward mental illness is rapidly decreasing, right? Completely wrong. As people know more of the facts about mental illness, three and a half times more Americans than in 1955 believe that mental illness is inevitably linked to violence. Social distance measures, and these are amazing data because it's been the same vignette scenarios that have been used since 55, so there's no method variance there. Levels of social distance have remained flat or gotten slightly worse. So as we know more, we're more fearful, which seems quite counterintuitive. Is the solution, as NIMH has proffered and funded, that we just need to call mental illness a brain disease, a disease like any other. Cancer is a disease, mental illness is a disease of the brain, often highly heritable, and if we give this biogenetic ascription, it's an uncontrollable cause, stigma will go down. Well, it turns out that in the first meta-analysis of this hypothesis, published by Cavalli and colleagues uh, in Australia a couple of years ago, if you believe that mental illness is caused biogenetically, you do blame the individual less. But you also believe that he or she will never get better, because after all, it's in their genes, uh, and you believe that you would not like to be anywhere near that person. So the biogenetic ascription increases hopelessness and social distance. At the same time, it decreases blame. So as Nick Haslam, the senior author on this meta-analysis, has recently published, it's a mixed blessings model. The solution to stigma is not saying it's a brain disease and then everybody will feel sympathetic to people with mental illness. It's far more complex than that. What about ADHD? Who would stigmatize ADHD? It's, the, it's pretty mild. People with ADHD do typical things a lot of the time and they have problems academically and socially, but that's the point. Parents of kids with what used to be called Asperger's, high-functioning autism, report far more stigma than parents of kids with serious autism where there's no speech because the attribution is, your kid is just weird. Looks like it's often a he, he can do it, but why does he act so aberrantly? So with ADHD and its impulsivity and inconsistency, the stigma is often quite high. And another reason, of course, is with these rates of overdiagnosis we've been talking about, it's become, I think, in many ways, trivialized. It's not a real illness. People are just disease mongering or looking for accommodations. Leibowitz at Yale, just finishing his grad career, has published some interesting recent data that if you are led to believe that ADHD is genetically caused, a biogenetic model, you do get pessimistic, but unlike for other forms of mental illness, you actually want to get closer to that kid. 
So it's an even more mixed blessing model for ADHD because the biogenetic perspective may make you think it really isn't his or her fault. What about medication? What about diversion? The use of stimulants for non-prescription usage, for smart pills. So what are the rates? I was asked to give two falls ago a talk in Marin County, wealthy suburbs north of San Francisco, quite liberal, by the PTA because 10% of the freshmen, the ninth graders, and 41% of the seniors in a confidential school survey were using other kids' stimulants to get better scores uh, and better SAT marks. This isn't college, this is high school. But what's the problem? Stimulants are smart pills. You stay awake later, you learn better. What's the harm? So Martha Farah, who published a psych bulletin paper on this a couple of years ago when I was editor, uh, and then has done some empirical work since, looked at what are the effects of stimulants, not for the ADHD range, which are pretty good on average, especially cognitively, but for the so-called normative population. The title of the psych bulletin article was, Are Stimulants Smart Pills? Provocative title. And in the first empirical trial, so this was the first trial of stimulants in college students without an ADHD diagnosis. The trial was medication and placebo, double blind, crossover across seven weeks, and every week a subset of 13 measures of learning were given working memory, verbal memory, fluency, et cetera. What was the average effect size for these normal students of the stimulant weeks compared to the placebo weeks? The effect size was 0.01. There was no improvement. In an ADHD group, you get good effect sizes in cognition. They added a 14th measure to their battery, which was a single item self-report questionnaire of how well did you do this week on the tests? And they got a huge effect size because it's hard to blind a stimulant. So the conclusion in the discussion of Ilieva et al. 2013 is stimulants for enhancing normal cognition are very effective at increasing false self-confidence in your learning. Now, amusing if not troubling, if you have ADHD symptoms at high rates and you're followed by a good practitioner, what are the odds that you'll become addicted to those medications? probably one in 500 to 1,000. There's almost no literature on it. What are the odds of becoming addicted to stimulants, like Concerta and Adderall, if you don't have ADHD and are taking them as smart pills or party pills? Most recent estimate is 15%. Emergency room visits for stimulants went up in the United States 360% in the last four years. So we hear about the opioid, opiate epidemic, but there's a stimulant epidemic too of addiction, especially for people who start off using their friends or their roommates pills because how could it hurt to stay up later or get that term paper done? I think it's uh, really selling a false bill of goods to the American public to think that stimulants are the answer for our national achievement test scores, et cetera, et cetera. What can we do about stigma in a preventive way? We're with a team now at Berkeley uh, working with a group called Bring Change to Mind, Glenn Close's anti-stigma organization, to see if a completely different approach might work. These are starting clubs in high schools. No mental health professionals. At the beginning of high school, you sign up for the French club, the Latin club. There's no more Latin clubs, but they're the rugby club. You sign up for the Let's Club, the Let's Erase the Stigma Club. Meets once a week. There's a teacher who's an advisor, like for any other club. You discuss difference and bullying, gay lesbian issues, mental health issues, could be in yourself or your friends or your family members, and it's not very scripted. It's an action-oriented, self-help, social action club. In our first quasi-experimental test, based on Nicole Merman's senior honors thesis at Berkeley, we found that a semester's participation in these clubs didn't improve your knowledge of the symptoms of depression or schizophrenia very much, but your social distance decreased and your attitudes toward mental health in general increased. We're doing a clinical trial now funded by Bring Change to Mind of 20 this year, 20 next year, 
randomly assigned to start these clubs early versus delay and start midway through the year to see if attitudes and social distance in this kind of grassroots uh, self-help model might improve and of course we'd like to expand this if the data are good nationally and to the kids who aren't in the clubs and to school administrators. Attitudes toward gay marriage have changed radically in the United States in the last 20 years. Just read the New York Times. Mainly because of people under 30. People my age are not the solution for mental illness stigma. It's going to be young people turning on their natural empathy and activism that we think might make a big difference. It's uh, a moving time for me to be an award winner here at APS. I've been a scientist my whole life. I grew up in a family with a lot of mental illness and a lot of high achievement, often in the same people. Can we, and many students are in the audience today, can the best minds now and future minds in our field, with the right scientific approaches, tests of mediation, multiple levels of analysis, doing experimental trials when possible, doing global big data analyses, also in the context of a public that wants to change and a government, state, local governments, as well as federal government that might actually want to do something about mental health, actually reduce the burden of mental illness. All the World Health Organization data are pretty clear. The burden of mental illness worldwide is increasing rather than decreasing. You can look at the dailies, you can look at the WHO reports, and again, at least in the US, with the consistent data across the last 60 years, attitudes have stayed flat or worsened rather than improved. So it's going to take a set-changing uh, group of efforts to make this happen. So I'd like to thank all the federal and private funding I've been able to get, all the participants in our studies, lab members, students, colleagues, friends, APS, of course. Here's a photo of our lab taken the year before last. And uh, it's been a great honor to give the Cattell Fellow Award Address. Thank you. Thanks very much. I thought we might have, um, I think we've got two minutes for questions if you have, and then we've got to clear out the room. So I can hardly see you, please. Right. What do I do as a professional, as a scientist, about stigma? What can aspiring individuals do? And I think it's multifaceted. So as with any social problem, uh, it's a problem of rights and discrimination. It's going to take enforcement of existing laws. It's also going to take changes in human hearts and developing empathy. It's also going to take a far different set of media perspectives. If you focus on any one aspect of a pernicious social issue, you're likely to, if it's like the old Freudian symptom substitution, you can bat it down and it's going to pop up in other places. I think it's going to take a systematic policy, individual, media, multifaceted approach that includes people speaking up about the topic themselves. And I have about my own family's experiences and will continue to do so. Um, this is not a simple problem. We're not going to solve and eradicate stigma in the next five years. This is a 50 to 100 year battle. Given the prevalence, given the impairment, we have to do it. Uh, one more, if I can see anybody out here. Please. Mm. Go ahead. Right, so I went fast in the talk. W why is stigma still on the increase? A huge issue is the public face of mental illness as Adam Lanza and gun violence and NRA, as you're pointing out. It's a mental illness issue, not a gun control issue. Never talked about is the fact that three times more Americans uh, killed themselves in 2014 than were killed by homicide. It's not in the news. Uh, not talked about is the fact that the risk of 
being a victim of violence is five times higher among mentally ill people than the rest of the population. The overall risk of being violent yourself is about the same with some exceptions, substance abuse, psychotic disorders. So I think the media are a big issue here and um, I'm not a policy person. I need to go back and to get a degree in it to do uh, more good work in this, but we've got to bring the best science to bear. And I'm encouraged by, on the awards night, uh, APS's uh, advocacy, both locally and globally, positions and taking on social issues. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that. So uh, I believe it's time to clear out for the next. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.